So, okay. Good afternoon, once again. Uh, now that we'd like to the start in the afternoon session. So afternoon session is a, a general uh, discussion, round table discussion. So uh, at first, uh, today's uh, morning time, we had a presentation from the Japanese side. So at first, we'd like to the ask uh, from uh, North American participants, uh, so any uh, comment or discussion or impressive uh, report. So we'd like to start the, the, this, our discussion. After that, uh, we also asking to the replay from the Japanese side. I think today's uh, morning presentation has uh, involving the very interesting information and um, uh, perspective or probably you are now more well understand is the characteristic of Japanese archaeology and the situation. Yeah. So let's start. It's uh, Daniel from the, here, yeah, you have a. First, I would like to, to thank my Japanese colleagues for their presentations. It has been a great pleasure to learn more about the cultural sequences and the approaches and the questions that you are all asking. Um, I don't know if I came away with more answers or more questions, but that's probably as it should be. I think one of the, one of the first questions I have, and I'm not sure it's really answerable, but I think it's something we should be thinking about, and that is, if there is a movement out of the paleo sakhalin Hokkaido uh, Kuril Peninsula into North America, what would we expect the genetic signature to look like? We have a pretty good understanding of what the, maybe not the precise timing, but how the, the movement of people affected the genetics. Um, is that consistent with what we would expect coming out of Japan? So that's the first question. The second thing I would offer um, is that the small flake-based trapezoidal forms um, of the earlier Upper Paleolithic in Japan, I think if we found those as isolated finds in North America, unless, and this, this sort of echoes a comment I made yesterday, but unless we had someone finding them who had a good understanding of the geological context, I think they would go unrecognized and nobody would, would pay them any mind. They wouldn't understand the significance. Um, I think the, the third observation I would make is that we all have a great interest in the economy of the people that we're studying and how that changed over time. I think there's a tendency to think of the use of microblades as um, maybe not going for, for the very largest animals. Um, but I'm mindful of of the work we did on Zhokov Island in the Russian High Arctic, where people were living almost exclusively on polar bears. And they were killing them with composite tools armed with microblades. So I think we need to pay some more attention to what, what we think about economies in relation to, to lithic industries. So thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. So, or maybe, and the first question is there, uh, Ota Sensei. <laughs> 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 
So mm -hmm. how do they trace a uh, uh, genetic uh, site in the uh, archaeological movement from Japanese archipelago or including the Korean Peninsula? Mm -hmm. So maybe better to the uh, answers from a uh, genetic site and also archaeologists. Mm -hmm. Am I the first party to answer that one? So let me allow me to speak Japanese. So Korean Peninsula. So actually, there is uh, not so much data of the human remains data. Gen genome is not so sufficient, rather limited. And uh, in China, the Chinese genome uh, is uh, actually analyzed, but uh, from different perspective. It is a uh, genome analysis, but uh, in different uh, contexts and in different perspective. Data is generated in China. However, I don't know. So I so I think uh, they need to reanalyze really that if uh, they want to answer that question from you. And actually, the analysis is not complete yet. Therefore, I'm sorry that uh, I cannot answer your question right away. So on the part of the Chinese continent, however, the genome information is being generated. So in some time, I can actually streamline the data information. Then I can answer your question. I'm sorry that I can't do it. So that is about the genetic genome information. Nagai-san, so what about the DNA information? So DNA and also the human movement might be overlapped in such a certain way. Have you got some idea? Izuho-san, Takakura-san, uh, can anyone, uh, anyone of you answer that question? I'm sorry, I can't uh, answer that part of the question. I'm sorry, I can't say. So the first question, genetic and also the human movement. Something is very clear that in late Pliocene and Pliocene and uh, DNA data is lacking along the Japan Sea. We don't have that sort of a genetic data in Japan Sea. Even we had that sort of a genome information, we can have more analysis and elucidate things better, but we don't. So we listen to the presentation. Also, LP, LEP, and the post population can be actually considered a sort of a hypothesis. We can have that sort of a hypothesis. But uh, the, from uh, the empirical data of archaeology, we have to have a lot and lots of an uh, assumption. And uh, actually, so I hope that uh, there is some advancement in the genetic research focusing on the human develop human movement. So I would like to ask this one. So not only that's an uh, actually the research, research uh, tools, but a biomarker sort of traces might be there in Japan. So have you found any biomarker type of uh, human uh, traces in Japan? And uh, that is an actually archaeological biomarker type of human traces in Japan. And so actually in other uh, so there are uh, animal and uh, traces and, uh, in Japan. And so near Osaka and uh, Kyoto, uh, we uh, discovered that sort of, sort of footprints and also the uh, tracks and uh, many animals. But uh, humans, as far as I know, I, I, as far as the Pliocene is concerned, uh, that we don't have, we haven't found any such uh, tracks uh, of a human. Which question was the third question? Is it enough? That's all? Okay, thank you very much. Hmm? So you talked about an, a microblade. So a microblade and a, a Japanese archipelago. So in Japan, on the eastern part of this archipelago, uh, there was uh, some animal hunting by using that microblade. In the Arctic uh, um, uh, zone, the polar bears were the main actually target in the hunting. But uh, what sort of animals do you think uh, they were actually being hunted by using microblade? Izumo sensei, Dr. Izumo. So please allow me to speak Japanese. So from Alaska, I talked about another situation from the perspective of Alaska. So one point and a site is in Alaska in which mammals 
uh, uh, traces are there. So horses, mammals, and also the migrating birds, like uh, uh, swans, were actually, actually identified, discovered in terms of their uh, tracks. In the case of uh, mammals, uh, direct uh, hunting was actually done by those uh, ancient people. Now, Francois is, um, and also Dr. Holmes were actually focusing on that issue, trying to identify the animals. But uh, directly, did they sell? No, there is no direct statement. Of the, yes, there were. Uh, but actually, the, actually, the horns, animal horns were actually processed so that they could be used uh, for the hunting. What about the birds? And maybe some small animals and small mammalian animals. So they were actually, actually, uh, actually exca excavated from the site. And so, uh, so if uh, humans had actually microbes, so were they used uh, for the large animals only? I don't think so. The targets were only limited to the large animals. I don't think so. But Ben might have uh, more perspective, and also maybe we can expect uh, some comments from Ben from a different uh, shade and uh, angle of thought on our mines uh, in the uh, Americas in Beringia for a long time. Um, more specifically, not just microblade composite points, but bifacial points within the same assemblages. So multiple weapon types. So it's not just a question of what are microblades being used for in hunting context, but what are the differences between the bifacial and, and microblade implements. Uh, I, I've, uh, in many years I've looked uh, Pretty broadly at this, we could go to Lugovskoya, which, where we have a, a mammoth vertebrae imprinted with a composite point. So we know uh, in Siberia, at least we have a smoking gun there. In uh, the region of Beringia, I'm investigating, we did a controlled study of many different assemblages with both um, uh, and cultures with both of those. And what we found is that typically microblade composite points tend to be associated with very large bodied mammals, mainly bison elk or wapiti and moose in lowland settings and bifacial point use within the same cultures in the context of upland hunting of smaller bodied ungulates like caribou and sheep. I don't want to overextend it beyond that region, but at least in, in Beringia, this seems to be a pretty significant difference um, and it seems to persist through time. Mm. Uh, Thank you. Now, J John, please. Uh, at Kokriyevo 1 uh, in the Yenisei Valley, there is a composite microblade point that's embedded in a bison scapula. That's, mm. that's the, only, the only case of that I know of in, from the Siberian Upper Paleolithic. Rubinoe site is also Lubnoi site is also clearly found in it, just I saw the pictures. How about in Hokkaido? Who are the targets of animal for hunting for microblade in Hokkaido? Well, first of all, for microblade from Hokkaido to down to the southern Kyushu, widely these were discovered in Japan. And for the Analysis of evidence is available, but in Kyushu, mainland Honshu, and Hokkaido, there could be the difference. Some people say there are difference. However, specifically, which are the targets of animals or that is the future challenge? That's the reality today. In the case of Hokkaido, first 25,000 years ago, microblade emerged. Since then, more than 10,000 years of period, microblades persisted. So in the change of environments, in many various cases, microblades were used. So just a single identified animal or identified targets, I don't think so, multi-purpose. Then what are they? Then unfortunately in today, in Hokkaido, well, including Hokkaido in archipelago of Japan, fossils of animals have not been discovered in the archaeology in Japan. Therefore, for the verification of the constitution, we do not know yet. Thank you. Do you have the, any comment or questions? I do have a question, and I want to, I guess, follow on a little bit in terms of 
uh, the discussion about micro blade micro core, the Ubetsu type that you Hirasawa talked about. So <clears throat> in your presentation, uh, you talk about a technological connection between Hokkaido and Eastern Beringia, just the Ubetsu distribution of that core type. So could you talk a little bit more about how you think Ubetsu core technology gets to interior Alaska? Was it a migration of people from Hokkaido, or is it the spread of an idea? Well, thank you for your question. Let me speak in Japanese. That's a very important question that I'm glad to receive, but very hard to answer as of today. Dr. Izuho asked me the same kind of question yesterday. In terms of direct migration of people, without that existence of microblades in Alaska might be difficult. If there are no people, then people should carry all those with them. But if that is proven, then direct migration of people should be the answer. But that's still the unclear points. If that's the case, human migration from PSHK, I cannot clearly state that without that evidence. But having said that, from the viewpoint of technology, it is sure that the same concept are the basis, in my opinion, the same concept is shared. So therefore, in the sort of the blackout area, or other than Hokkaido, if we can have the narrow down of the good chronology, then if we have the good sequence of order of the dates, then we can trace back the possible routes where to where. Maybe according to chronological order, we could establish the assumption in the future. Sorry, as of today, we cannot state. But other than micro core, how about the multiple or how about the use of the flakes and so on? In overall, what do you think? Well, the assemblages of the swan point for the, that is the one core micro core for bifacial, and there is a lot for the scrapers. And for the scrapers or chills, we are looking at those in Siberia and in Japan and Northeast Japan and Alaska also, we see the common topic. Alayana type scraper, chill, are chisels are there. And that has the wide distribution like a Ubetsu. That's been the report. But when you look at the, those devices, scrapers in Swan Point, technically, technology used is different. So from the scraper's point of view, and the core of the microblaze, we should consider from the both flow of the technology, those should complement each other. But those buran or the chisels or the those should be complied. But we haven't identified those. That's also difficult to make conclusion yet. It's interesting that um, Yubetsu appears and is clearly in place in Eastern Beringia, and then it changes, you know, as you talked about in your presentation. So um, whether or not that represents, and maybe you could give me your opinion, is that just simply evolution of the idea in place, or is that a different people bringing a different kind of technology? What do you mm. think? Well, in Alaska, I don't think that the intrinsic generation in Alaska. But I think UBS technique itself is very complex. Uh, that's very complicated. But 
approach is very strict approach. So therefore, technically speaking, that is high level conservative technology, I would say. For those kind of technologies, rather than multi chronologically, but a certain driver for maybe migration of the people or contacts of people, exchanges of people, that might be more likely, that could be more natural to think. Just have a follow on this. And um, so I think that's interesting. That, I mean, these are, like you say, such specific technologies. It's maybe, if I'm understanding, difficult to say that Yubetsu is turning into campus or something like that later. And maybe that's not what you're saying, but I think that's what I heard. Um, it's an interesting situation because there's, we have no measure at that point of, let's say, the genetics of human skeletons. So I guess what I'm trying to set up is considering the concept that does culture and genetics, do they always have to go together? Is that what we think? Do they always have to go together? Or could there be any room ever for culture to move independently of the genetics? It's a, it's a question that may be impossible to answer, but you know. <laughs> Well, in my own personal opinion, always I think that one technology is no need to be combined with a certain people's group. Well, this time, UBETS was closed up, clearly this time. The reason is in Swan Point, they're not the only ones in Swan Point. That is why based on that, on the Eurasian side, we narrow down the candidates. So that's my approach that I took. From the different point of view, for example, in Hokkaido, you bet and the Togeshita style that the flake material, microblade technology, are excavated from the same assemblages. So therefore, I do not think that that's just a pure connection between the one lithic is connected with the certain assemblages. So therefore, in the indirect evidence, and the oldest Alaska, there's only one technology. But as a possibility, other from the second swamp point like sites would be will be recovered, and then not only UBETS, but the other micro blades technology might be excavated. I think it's likely, it's not strange. So there could be, there are several technological framework can be contained in one lithic. So I think that's possible in future. わかりました。ここでやめておきます。ありがとうございます。辛抱強くお考えいただきまして、いやまた後でお戻りましょう。そうですね。またで戻りましょう。マイケルさん、何か質問かコメントがありますか？マイクが入っていません。非常にこの考学遺伝そして日本の古関教学の発表に非常に感銘を受けました。It's about uh, the lithic artifacts and how to evaluate, you know, the details of those lithic artifacts to, you know, look at the relationships between stem points and Japan as well as the Americas. But one thing I'd like to learn a little bit more about is, I mean, just, you know, I don't know if it's possible here, but, you know, uh, the dating of these sites and the geological context of these sites. I mean, there are, uh, uh, you know, so much hinges on geochronology, and I was wondering, is it all based on charcoal dating? Is it dispersed charcoal? Is, are the dates coming from HARS? Um, you know, what, what kind of depositional environments are there? Do you have stratigraphy at sites? And, and so much of this is tied up in, in reports that a lot of us don't have access to, so. Uh, you know, someday it'd be good to have detailed geochronological and geological information available from a lot of these key sites, especially the ones with stem points. So, but any enlightening would be great on geochronology. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, some, do you have the question? 
ですね。見てプレイ。じゃあ、いや、もしあれば。あれますか。うん、えー、っと、私。Well, for the chronology, yes, is the issue. When I listen your presentation,、uh, my conclusion is.、Uh, Uh, very difficult. There should be some variation and verification in the background of the, the sure dating、uh, chronology. I have not、uh, mentioned about this, but Pilikadi site. You mentioned the phase one, and I said that this is、uh, possibly going back to the 16,000 years ago. And also, Tachikawa one,、uh, which is also in the 16,000, one which is excavated in the Hattori Dai site. I think we need to survey for geoarchaeological aspect, especially for Hattori Dai site. Yes, there is one big block. And inside the block, Uh, there are some charcoal, charcoal、uh, objects, and、uh, measuring those charcoal, and、uh, yeah, more than six items.、Uh, but those charcoal,、uh, one of them is very conglomerate group, e d and there is yet another group, and another group. I think seventeen、uh, thousand or twenty thousand. The dating is、uh, changed or different. But、uh, so 13,000 or 50,000 group is now picked up and highlighted. But yet there is another group, I have to say. And there are still ambiguous dating for those charcoal objects in those famous sites. And we need to investigate more in detail. Otherwise,、uh, I think we can't say for sure.、Uh, Yes,、uh, we need a geoarchaeological investigation to be enhanced. And、uh, if there is no more information in report, official report, we don't try to investigate any more. And you mentioned about the、uh, Pilika D site. The、uh, chronology of Pilika D,、uh, I think、uh, Holocene time is included. So, inclusive of a Holocene, as for, I think we need to re investigate、uh, the chronology of the、uh, Pelicani site.、Uh, there is、uh, the radiocarbon and luminescence、uh, methodology using two methodology.、Uh, there is a re a research using two methodology in Hokkaido, and I think for the future it will elucidate clear cut dating by combining two methods. A question Do you have? No, that's,、right. good. That, was, that was about it. I'll pass it on、okay. to John.、Yeah. Next is John. I have、um, two observations to make about、uh, the settlement of northern Eurasia by anatomically modern humans and its relationship to the settlement of Beringia. The first is that there seem to be two major phases of population settlement and, and expansion in northern Eurasia. The first of these phases begins, as we were saying yesterday, Uh, during Greenland Interstadial 12, about which starts at about 47,000 years ago. And as Dr. Sikora reminded us yesterday,、um, this does not seem to be one, only one group or one population. There actually seem to be several groups or several waves, perhaps, of modern humans coming into northern Eurasia at this time and beginning this pattern of initial settlement. Uh, at least some of which is associated with the initial Upper Paleolithic、uh, industry. That phase ends、uh, at about 40,000 years ago with the beginning of Heinrich Event IV, which is a period of extreme cold that lasts for about 2,000 years. And in Eastern Europe, it is immediately preceded by the Campanian ignimbrite volcanic er eruption,、mm. which、uh, took place in southern Italy. At almost exactly 40,000 years ago, and spread an immense 
plume of ash over southeastern Europe and over much of the East European plain and seems to have wiped out all plant and animal life uh, on the East European plain for some period of time. And then uh, about 38,000 years ago, we begin Greenland Interstadial 8, period of protracted and pronounced warmth in northern Eurasia, in the northern hemisphere generally. And that seems to me coincides with the second phase of population settlement and movements, which consists of population expansions out of specific areas in Eurasia that are characterized by relatively high plant and animal productivity. They tend to be the wetter areas, wetter and warmer areas. Southwestern Europe uh, is one of these areas, and at about 38,000 years ago, we see people apparently coming from Western Europe, I guess this would be Goyet 116, we see people uh, that are tied to this West European lineage showing up on the East European plain. They show up at Kostjanki uh, about 37,000 years ago. They're above the ash. We actually have the Campanium nimbrite ash at Kostjanki. And so we can see the relationship of the human remains and the archaeological remains uh, to the ash. And that, it seems that that population continues to move across northern Eurasia. And uh, we, it's related to the folks who show up at the Yana River sites somewhat later during uh, Greenland interstadials of five and six, two brief interstadials take place around 33,000, 31,000 years ago. Uh, this is also the time in which, of course, we see all these people flooding into Japan, uh, the early Upper Paleolithic of Japan, which also begins at about 38,000 and reflects, presumably, a regional movement of populations in East Asia. And it seems to me that's, that seems to be a parallel phenomenon to what is going on in Western Eurasia. And so my first observation is, is that the, the settlement of Beringia seems to be related to the second phase of population movements and settlement in northern Eurasia, not the first phase. We have some problematic evidence of people in Beringia uh, as early as maybe 45,000, uh, but, it's, but it's, highly, it's highly problematic. Um, it consists of modified animal bones from the Bung Tol site particularly, uh, which are, it's difficult to be sure if they're really humanly modified. So the first, the convincing, compelling evidence we have of human settlement dates to this second phase of population expansions out of re these regional areas. Um, the other observation, which is related to this, is that I emphasized the importance of this massive uh, hunter-gatherer engineering knowledge base yesterday in generating this uh, very complex body of technology for dealing with all of these environmental problems that modern humans encountered in northern Eurasia, not simply um, the uh, lack, of the scarcity of resources in many areas where it was very cold and dry and plant and animal productivity was, was significantly lower than places like Western Europe or Japan, um, but also um, technologies for dealing with, with the, the extreme winter temperature. Um, and this seems to have, this seems to have been adequate for occupying a great many, perhaps most of the, most of the habitats and climate zones in northern Eurasia. But I think Beringia is the exception because the, the earliest evidence we have for people in Beringia is in the Arctic. It's not along the coast or in central Beringia or in the Tanana Valley or somewhere. It's up in the Arctic. It's tied to the, this exposed East Siberian Arctic shelf and this enormous dry plain that's apparently supported this relatively rich steppe tundra biome. But it's above the Arctic Circle. And it seems to me that this is the one place where technology alone was not sufficient because of low UV radiation and vitamin D deficiency. And eventually, when we see the peoples um, spreading through the Arctic near the end of the Pleistocene, the ancient Paleo-Siberians uh, and their descendants, they are carrying uh, quite a few genetic adaptations to high latitude. 
Some of these are diet, some of these are dietary adaptations. Some of them are adaptations specifically to low UV radiation relate to melanin content in the skin and the eyes, so forth. Uh, I'm not sure that the the first people in Beringia, the Yana River people, had any of these genetic adaptations. I believe in that Mao et al. paper that was out a couple of years ago, um, the EDARV370A allele, which is potentially related to low UV radiation, vitamin D deficiency through breast milk, um, that, those, that allele is not being carried um, by the, is not found in the Yana River people. But it does show up later on in APS uh, and in living Arctic peoples. And in fact, it spread throughout the Native American population, suggesting that they're all derived ultimately from a group that was in the Arctic at some point in the past. Um, well, that's all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So, no comment. Oh. Is there any comment, uh, some uh, question? About the EDAR uh, uh, adaptation. So, yeah, that seems to appear right after the LGM. It's everywhere. So all the pre-LGM populations, they don't really have it. Yana doesn't have it. But, but once you get to uh, the post-LGM populations, then uh, uh, the ones in the Amur River Basin, they all already have it. And, and it's, it's basically at really high frequency from that moment on. Interestingly, though, it's not in the Jomon. So, so that's that. It, so yeah, the question is, which maybe is not that surprising, given that we, we think that they diverged quite a bit earlier. Also, but but it, it seems to appear at some point during the LGM somewhere, and then really quickly it takes off in, in East Asia. Well, I've wondered if perhaps there were some dietary sources of vitamin D that were present in Arctic Beringia during the interstadial before the beginning of the last glacial maximum, and these might include um, eggs. Uh, a major source of vitamin, dietary source of vitamin D, is is eggs. Uh, and if there were lots of, during the period when it was warmer and wetter up there, if there were lots of ponds and lakes, uh, we would expect migratory waterfowl, and we would expect eggs, uh, lots of eggs. And perhaps when conditions became much drier during the last glacial maximum, this source disappeared. And then another major dietary source is mushrooms, uh, which also require, of course, some tundra, damp soils that require more moisture. We don't, we don't expect to see mushrooms out on a step. Um, and so that might be another dietary source that disappeared and thus um, necessitated the, these genetic adaptations on the part of the people who occupied Arctic Beringia during the last glacial maximum, if indeed anyone did. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, so uh, there was an observation made by him, and do you have any response and, uh, after listening to that kind of comment and observation? They did with uh, uh, your suggestion, but uh, we now uh, remember um, from the Marita uh, child, uh, children's grave found that the, the flying swan figure. Yeah. So why <coughs> that flying uh, swan figure into specific uh, position keep it? It also, also it, the swan is uh, migrated seasonally, and uh, probably we more needed to their mention to their food resources in the LGM. Yeah. I so, could maybe comment. Yeah, please. Briefly on that. Um, John raises a really important issue, and I think waterfowl broadly has not received enough attention in the paleoecological literature. Um, we have some very strange occurrences in eastern Beringia where we seem to have a, a, a dominance, uh, uh, very many sites with uh, very early waterfowl, like Upper Sun River Component 1, with you know, quite a number of different species, broken mammoths, one point, et cetera. And it seems to be really important during the bowling alarid, but we don't see it later, and we don't know why. We don't know if there was a flyway disruption, if there were other issues, climate uh, related issues that changed um, abundance um, or diversity, but it's an unknown. And I think it's something maybe that should be looked at more broadly um, with the data that we have. Thank you very much. Yeah. Maybe, you, yes, you also. No. Martin, Maybe, please continue. continue. Yeah. yeah, I would also like to uh, thank my colleagues very much for this very, very interesting talk. So I think I, I have, again, learned a lot about uh, uh, the 
uh, certain um, the complexities of also the, 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 the Japanese record. And I think for me, as a geneticist coming into this, I know I've known mainly about Jomon, and it even seems like within Jomon uh, period there might have been quite some some changes, at least technologically, if I um, can refer to Dr. Nagai's talk. I think what I would like to comment on is just, uh, again, take it back to what we know about the genetics there and, and maybe clarify a few things that also were picked up before in, in, in some of the discussions uh, in terms of what what we would expect as geneticists, what some of these populations would look like. So it, 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 it seems to me we can, the, the pre-Jomon period in Japan, the Paleolithic period, I, you know, where there's no genetic data, we can't really say anything from, from, from that point of view. So any migration out of, out of uh, uh, Hokkaido or other places in Japan at that time, until we get human DNA, we can't really uh, make any comments on that. If I would want to make a bet of what the people would look like if it was not Jomon, uh, I would probably think the closest genomes we have from that region are these two Tianyuan cave from 40,000 years ago and then the, the, the 33,000 year old genome from, from the Amur River basin. Both of these are part of the same sort of broader meta population, it seems, and, and, and are genetically quite similar. And so, particularly this AR33K is, is, is geographically quite a bit closer to Japan. It's also around that time we think that maybe the divergence of the Jomon uh, lineage would have happened. So, it, it, you know, it, it might. My bet would be, would it could be either that or, or maybe even people related to Yana. The point is we don't really know, but, but those are the only anchor points we have at that time. In terms of Jomon genetics, well, we, we certainly know quite a bit more now over the last uh, two, three years. So there's quite a number of genomes now, and what, what is clear are two things. First of all, they are really a distinct, a very distinct lineage among the early East Asian populations. So there's a lot more data now from China also, from coastal and inland places. Um, from, from northeastern Siberia, all those Chinese and Siberian genomes are actually all genetically quite a bit closer to the ancestors of Native American, to the East Eurasian ancestors of Native American than the Jomon people are. So Jomon is both very distinct genetically and very, very, um, very homogeneous within Japan. So we have now genomes from the incipient to the uh, late Jomon period in, in Honshu, uh, they're all very homogeneous. There's no distinction there that we can, well, you know, not, not much at least, certainly not with respect to non-Jomon uh, genomes. And on Hokkaido, it, it's only late Jomon remains, but they're also extremely similar to the ones from, from, from Honshu. So maybe my question to Dr. Nagai, like if there would be a migration from Honshu up, you know, I, I presume the, 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 the hypothesis would be that the people migrated along the Kuril Island chain into, uh, towards Kamchatka. If these are incipient Jomon people that would be moving up there, then my prediction would be that the people at Ushki should also be Jomon-like, and it should not look like the Native American ancestors or ancient Beringians, because that would be my guess that this would be the, what the, the people in Hokkaido at that time looked like based on what we see in the rest of Japan. So is, 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 there, uh, is there any other evidence in terms of like uh, along the way on the Kuril Islands, for example, are there archeological sites that would suggest that there was some migration up or, or, or is it maybe related to, to just technological uh, transmission of information rather than, than, than associated with the migration of peoples? Nagai-san, how uh, Dr. Nagai, what do you think? So I would like to answer that question in Japanese. And thank you very much. It's a very fantastic question. Thank you. And also, it is a very important question. So on my part, let me say uh, this one. I would like to do my best to answer. Well, the comparison, you said the morphology or actual migration people were just information only migrated. I have been pondering upon that. But this time, well, what should be the unique idea which cannot mimic? That was the initial question. So as I said, I built up the indicators, the habitus, that's the word, for they are making lists, but from parent to children, embodiable technique or skills embedded in body, physical body. That's what I attention to. And I did those analyses. Then 
It's true that the Honshu, Hokkaido, there are big differences. Well, I think as you know, Tachikawa point, Kosewa point, so the base shape, morphological shape of tongue was very important, but not that point, but the habitus, habitus of the flake trace that's uh, embedded in a physical body, then what's that? Then we asked those ourselves. Then Taisho three, that is the in the Beringia warm period. And then the pottery went northward in that period. And then this habitus of the lith was also going to north. And I made a salation. Salation is another physical body. That's a down pressure, basically. Down pressure is easier to make. The down pressure is the, this type of muscle movement. So, tongue, so that is also moving. Likewise, these are one set and a perfect pattern and the salation together went northward. I suspect that migration of people did that, in my opinion. So just information move. I don't think so. People migration is involved. That's my thought. And then further, how is it going to reach Kamchatka Peninsula? That's the point. Very difficult. Now, I have faced the barrier that I have to overcome because we have the less material specimens. And in Hokkaido, perhaps I didn't say this, but in Hokkaido, there was a mixture original microblade complex people, and then chronologically, the different lineage moved from Honshu to Hokkaido. And in Taisho three assemblage, when we looked at that, that the Taisho sound sites were the target three. Elements of Honshu, for example, press precedence, uh, check so nuts, so those are mixed into those. But not exactly the same. In micro flakes or flakes blaze, or that was changed to the hematite and the obsidian. And but uh, the same sort of thing compared here and there. And rather than the move, but always mutation should be considered and always. Uh, while making the mixing each other, then together moving northward. That could be possible. Well, what we can do in the research, the typology, well, the assumption or precondition is the solid dating. Then we have to excavate those. So as a PhD paper, I already took 10 years, and one indicator was presented here. But so far, how? for the people who have the tradition incorporating those. And is that really people moving northward for why? Well, I haven't yet identified the answer. But I think a basic pattern of mixture is likely to be the characteristics. So isolithic style, that's my face. Habitus is unconscious level of the technique of the human people. I think we should make more attention to those aspects of the subconscious level of skills. Well, making changes in the mutation exactly like the gene, genome. So maybe better not to have the fixed idea. For even for the technology, it might be similar to the gene. Now, next person, Ben. I thank all my Japanese colleagues for very informative papers uh, this morning. And I think when uh, Dr. Honda and I originally uh, you know, planned this meeting, this was one key question to really, really dig down deep into the depths of sort of stem point traditions, varying ideas. And I like this. I'm, I'm happy to see you know, three different perspectives on stem points and, and maybe some areas of agreement and disagreement. Um, I had some comments that actually tied into um, something Lauren had said and also Mike had said earlier that we keep diffusion on the table, uh, particularly given the time frame that, that uh, Dr. Nagai has suggested. Um, 
I, I echo Mike with, I think a critical issue is this phase one dating. Um, and it seems like uh, Dr. Takakura had some, there may be some questions about this phase one, um, because phase two and phase three won't be early enough uh, to deal with the genetic data that we've got. This would represent something that I agree with Martin. If, if this was present, it would be Jamon, and we don't see any record in, in the later Native Americans, perhaps Ushki. Um, so one of the comments I had was um, that there's complexity along the route. So you, you Dr. Nagai, you, you mentioned um, some points in California that look very similar uh, to some of the materials that you have in, in Japan. And I'm thinking of the intervening space, uh, particularly in Northwest Coast, where the Kingi complex is the earliest bifacial tradition we have around the early Younger Dryas. Um, and it's very distinct and very different and not like that. So, you know, I'm thinking in my mind about, you know, convergence. Um, and I know Dr. Takakura mentioned that that is a possibility for some convergence, things that look similar later. Um, so this might be a hurdle to think about if there was a tradition of diffusion of an idea uh, or a series of ideas um, versus movement of people. You know, there are different traditions along the way. Um, particularly in the time frame that we're looking at, between, you know, after 13,000. Um, so I just hold that up as something to think about with, with variation. Um, but I like the idea. I mean, it's very interesting, very intriguing. We talked a little bit about um, failed migrations or, or lineage extinctions, which I think we all agree would be likely, particularly with small hunter-gatherer groups in new areas, perhaps without the um, connections, the social connections that could maintain a viable population as they enter into, into new areas. And I wanted to highlight this emerging complexity, which I think is very interesting. Um, if we have movement at that time, we also have other movement. Uh, two sites we didn't talk about yet uh, in the session is Urez 22 and Nikita Lake, uh, both found in, um, in, in northern Siberia, extreme western Beringia, uh, where Vladimir Patulko uh, and colleagues have documented a very interesting sequence an early sequence around 15,000 years, 14.9, of a microblade tradition, followed uh, a few hundred years later by uh, a non-microblade tradition that has what I think many of my colleagues consider to be Chandadan-like materials. And about 500 years later, you see the same transition, uh, these two sequences emerging in eastern Beringia with Swan Point and then later Chandadan, uh, Chandadan materials. And this is the same time that we have this. So I think if anything, even if we don't have answers, uh, this is posing new challenges and new questions that uh, you know, we don't have the, the genetic data yet to you know, fully, fully evaluate, but I find this very exciting and very interesting. Um, let's see if I have a question out of that. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, one question. Um, it, it reminds me, uh, thinking about diffusion, of the toggling harpoon head and the emergence of that in the far north, the same region. It's very quick. It's, it's adopted by multiple peoples that aren't genetically related or only distantly related, and it was one element of a toolkit. So we might think of that as a proxy if we have the stemmed point idea or tang point, but yet we don't have the other assemblage characteristics, like the big scrapers you, you, you guys have shown. I don't think we have those in the record, so it might be helpful to maybe constrain hypotheses with assemblages moving or elements, different elements of assemblages, or single ideas. Um, and I just, you know, highlight that as a, as a possibility. But I think we should keep diffusion on the table as well. Mm. Dr. Takakura, any comments for the dispersion? Any response? Well, for the movement of the culture, of the lithic culture, Therefore, bay facial point technology is one thing, or the microblade is another one. But for reduction sequence, at that stage, what type of technology is transmitted in what way? When interaction is made among people, then information can be conveyed. I think that's the case, but in those cases, then ultimate finished products or just immediately one step before or at the stage of a blank for those physical things, how is they 
transmitted to the neighboring villages or distant villages. For those possibilities, we do not come up with the methods in archaeology. What should be the indicator to analyze those? What type of transition of the culture? We do not establish the clear-cut framework. That's my question. One specific example is the technology for the biface. Mr. Nagai used the habitus, habitus of the people, but for the points. What was the initial material? And then to make blank. So those processes should be in existence. And for those steps, with what kind of communication is that possible to be communicated? That should be discussed. Well, the finished point products, looking at those finished product is just limited. That's one way of the transition of communication of their culture. But well, some sort of technical information should be only possible with the very close contacts. So therefore, between the distant places, the dissemination of the technology of the lithics, then is that just a concept or in the contact of people, then that was communicated to those people. Well, different kinds of interpretation is possible. But at this stage, we do not see the clear-cut direction for future in archaeology. I think that's the open area for research. In that sense, research in this area is not enough. We just limit the discussion in Japan only, or sometimes only for Eurasia. But rather than that, including the whole Americans, we want to have the discussion. But if we are trying to do so, then dispersion of the people migration can be possible combined with the migration people. So that could be the new challenge, those areas or regions or good future issues for research. So therefore, we would like American researchers to look into more for the conveyance of the technology of the lithic. And uh, we are quite interested in your approach. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, so yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree with everything you said. Um, uh, there was an earlier question, I think, uh, that that I think Mike, I'm not sure, well, maybe one of the, the Japanese colleagues posed, and that maybe it was, yeah, you, the, the, the transitions and how quick these transitions can happen among people that are just changing ideas about making stone tools. And I think in the part of the world that I work, it can happen rapidly. Um, and I think one challenge to all of us is that with such small populations and entering into new areas, the, the potential for almost untraceable changes, because it would be among very archaeologically low visible populations, uh, it could change and we wouldn't see it or we wouldn't know it or it'd be at, at a very low level of detectability. So any element that can help us bridge large regions like the Ubetsu is an excellent example because it's so complicated, people aren't going to innovate it, you know, uh, convergently um, is going to be really helpful to us. But I think I go back to our original discussion where the American record is so different at most Paleo-Indian sites. You just can't find good analogs in, in most of Asia. Um, so it's a challenge I think we need to work together on um, to help resolve. So thank you. Yes, uh, Dr. Potter mentioned. Well, the, I think we need to uh, know the chronology more firmly. And uh, for this, I am preparing the uh, paper in English now. So I hope you take a look at it and please give me a comment later. Can I ask a question to Dr. Potter? One thing I definitely want to ask is that uh, uh, important thing. Earlier, you mentioned in Hokkaido, the people who moved to 
Hokkaido, they had the tool. And in Honshu, in Jomo period, we had a tremendously nice, well, tool. Uh, but uh, when they go up northwards, that technology is in a way lost or forgotten. But uh, how the Honshu tradition is why disappeared, or there is a kind of a blank period, or what is the reason that people, when they move northwards, they lost that uh, tradition? Was lost, just so I understand. So in okay. English, why is they lost? Why is they lost the pottery making tradition in, in the northern part of uh, Korea, or uh, Kamchatka Peninsula? Or Alaska. <laughs> well, that's, that, uh, that is an, a very big question, a very important question, and a question I don't know that we have the capacity to answer with the poor samples we have um, throughout much of the regions that all of us work in. Um, I think the, the likelihood of a, an analog of a founder's effect, um, I think we can easily see uh, of people moving into, particularly an area that has different resources or slightly different physiography where mobility strategies are gonna be changing, number one. Uh, number two, the predictability of raw material, toolstone. So I'm thinking of how great Hokkaido is with wonderful toolstone availability and how poor some of the areas in the far north are uh, with, with less toolstone. And colonizers will even have a worse problem because it's an unfamiliar landscape. And so what, what technologies would be helpful in that, in that context, it could change. Um, and so you could have entire suites lost. The, the way I think about the Paleo-Indian record, and part of the, the Beringian record too, is that we have a large suite of late Upper Paleolithic, Siberian, East Asian cultural traditions with many elements, various burins, microblade, uh, you know, various biface traditions. And we have like a smaller version of that. You know, we have blade cores, we have blade technology, uh, we have various biface traditions and flakes uh, that are being used as tools, but it's a, it's a subset, right? We don't see a lot of that, that variation um, that we see in Asia. And I, I, don't th I don't think it's an answerable question right now as to why certain elements were lost. It's probably individually determined with different regions uh, based on the different economic problems they had. And once, they are out of touch with other uh, related peoples further south, then they, whatever changes they make will be different and it will then be carried on by their descendants. I think maybe that, I hope that answers somewhat. I know. Yeah, yes, that's the point I wanted to ask about. So as Dr. Pata said, yes, a small group when they move and uh, towards a very unfamiliar environment, unknown land, so that the uh, resource, original material may not be found there. And in order to adapt to a new environment, in a way, a kind of a cultural tradition they had cannot be brought into the new area. And some of the elements would be lost. So depending on the situation, there are some missing parts. And that the pottery making may not be carried on in a newer area. And one more, uh, one more point too that I think may get into you know some discussions with um, you know Lauren's work and others on and and also Mike's work on early variation. I think what's intriguing to me is to think about uh, work uh, that Martin, uh, that that Esky and and other geneticists have done to indicate a very unique kind of a spread, not a linear expansion but a radial uh, starburst expansion of Native Americans south of the ice. And in that context, I could easily see, because we have those lineages early and they're divergent, um, like uh, the, the paper by Pasta et al. Uh, looking at South America, there were multiple waves of Paleo-Indians in South America. One was related to Anzic, but the, the, the difference between those early groups and the Anzic genome, I mean, it's it's relatively short, so maybe a couple hundred years maybe, and you already have two different lineages uh, moving into South America. So in that context, I could easily see uh, trial uh, and error. You know, 
you would be in a risk uh, prone mode. You know, you, you, you can risk, in other words, changing your technology and seeing what works. And that may be relating to why we see such differences in some of these early sites, um, because it relates to the nature of the demographic shifts and the demographic nature of this expansion where they're not running into other people, potentially. And so they're then free to vary their technology and then later mix in interesting ways. Um, perhaps that might maybe what we're seeing with Clovis. By the time Clovis is uh, on the scene, this could be diffusion of new ideas across different populations. And that, that has been raised before as an idea. Um, but that could be a way to accommodate the different variation early on and later. Uh, you can continue. Yes, uh, continuing the uh, issue we are discussing, may I make a comment? Myself, well, I am not a specialist in this uh, uh, chronology and also in this area. However, having heard your presentation in this symposium, well, from Eurasia to American continent, uh, the population transfer, uh, which entails the cultural transfer and also how human group has moved. As Dr. Hoheka Aria mentioned, in the process, uh, according to the environmental change, genetical adaptation should have happened. So the kind of uh, physical and the cultural traits of uh, the human must be looked into from various angles. So in this way, we are discussing about a research of a related area and a related discipline uh, is very important. That's what I held, felt. And also the, the uh, pottery uh, transfer that we are discussing now um, is Dr. Izuho and Dr. Nagai's presentation uh, bring me to the thought that well, from Hokkaido to the American continent, uh, can the possibility of a migration uh, should have happened. But uh, at that time, uh, already the pottery existed. So as uh, Dr. Izuho mentioned, in that period, uh, there is a great climate change, which triggered the innovations. And also, there is the uh, lithic innovation as well and from Eastern Asia, the pottery appeared in a very early period in East Asia. Well, there was a repetition of a warm and cold period, and the invention of the pottery uh, is very adaptive to some environment, but when it was not transferred to the American continent, for some reason. That is because of uh, time frame and also the uh, migration uh, period, how long the migration took place, um, the, how the pottery is adapted to the environment. Some environment, yes, but other environment, not. So t for the, I think, a stone uh, I think a point as well to find out the uh, suitable resource to make the projectile point is very crucial. Pottery as well. How to find the clay material which is suitable for making a good pottery. So pottery making and also the uh, I think uh, the lithic um, uh, weapon making is different and inclusive of uh, what uh, physical uh, force is required to make them. So why the pottery was not transmitted to American continent? Is there any reason? S well, the uh, migration beyond the Beringia, the timing and the, uh, I think uh, the migration duration is a key, I think. So if you have any comment on this, uh, I just would like to hear that. Uh, Izuho san, Dr. Izuho, have you gotten some answer? Thank you. That subject uh, is uh, often in my mind. I often think about it deeply. It's very, very important. 
So actually, I cannot uh, cover all the aspects of the question. Let me start with some basic, basic dispersion. And is it migration or the information transmission? There are various models. So, so I would uh, call them as dispersal. So dispersal must have happened many times, not only from east to west, but the other way around, also south and north, and also I mean, south to north and north to south. And there were various uh, directions of that uh, information exchange or transmission. There is another important point. We are going into the issue of an earthenware. earthenware. In the early stage, and uh, when the first Americans and were emerging and migrated, and uh, I don't think it could be information exchange because there was nobody in the America. So it has to be migration. People had to migrate, not the information. So did they have and uh, carry the earthenware with them when migrating into Americas? So that was part of the question. I think and uh, there is such a potential we can think about. They maybe they were carrying earthenware. So Iz Kasan uh, has gotten a certain uh, review. I often work with her. So uh, the, in the early stage, and uh, in the the earthenware emerged and in various uh, places in Asia, and so context and uh, various things. But uh, the hunting and also collecting people, but not uh, agricultural people in various localities, and earthenware was discovered in various uh, contexts, but uh, collector and hunters. Another, I am a geoarchaeologist, therefore I would like to mention this one, by all the means. So in the high latitude, a freeze saw was there. So maybe it was uh, damaged, and so we cannot uh, see them. But uh, in Hokkaido, we can see them just uh, barely. But uh, in Honshu, uh, we could see them, a large one. In uh, uh, Tachikawa, Hokkaido, I joined that uh, excavation. Very, very small one, because bits and pieces. Uh, so it is some surface uh, context. Because of the freeze and the saw, freeze, so freeze and the uh, soil was sold. So more than uh, latitude 45, uh, the earthenware was not absent. And uh, below that, uh, there were earthenware. The same culture. However, there is a clear cut between absence and an uh, actually presence of earthenware. That is a very basic subject. We need to see that. There are, otherwise, we cannot know whether those an early migrants were actually, actually carrying us and were not. Thank you. And Dr. Uh, Ho Joe Hoka, uh, so you talked about uh, biological adaptation, Dr. Hofaka. Hofaka. And I was actually thinking about it for quite a long time. We have got a certain data. So, so in German, and the Kitama, and actually the genome of those migrants in the northern route was not so much found. So genome is absent. So in the northern migrating people, there were populations. Maybe they had a small population, I seven. So because of the small population, so there were big kind of migrants coming from the south. So they were actually present, but the genome was actually diminishing. Therefore, there is an, uh, less and less in, in, in genetic uh, information uh, passed on to the, their offsprings. EDAR was uh, actually mentioned. Adaptation was happening in uh, relation to EDAR. There are papers. Positive selection was happening to some extent. Actually, the requirement is that a certain population size. Otherwise, then, uh, actually, that uh, by chance, the uh, potential is larger. So drifting is causing that uh, variability, and but the positive selection is higher. In that case, and actually, we can say that uh, their population size was large, not so small. And the frequency was actually elevated. That was mentioned in the paper. Therefore, there is no evidence. But we could suspect that that was happening in relation to the population size. Microbrays were mentioned since yesterday. Along the Yellow River, we could discover them. But then to the south of Yellow River, no. I don't think and there was no such. So Chinese archaeologists and does not, do not mention the presence. So that is actually some concern in my mind. Technology must have been passed on, transmitted. If it had reached the North America, why didn't they go to the south of China? It's rather mysterious. Maybe biological limitations were actually happening. That's why that information was not passed on. That is related to the adaptation. The population size was not so small. 
quite large. But then due to some biological reasons, and uh, they migrated and uh, transmitted to the north, not the south, not the south. Therefore, biological adaptation should be actually elucidated from various aspects. And uh, we need to shed light from that direction too. Uh, thank you very much. So I would like to entertain questions from the participants and also the floor. Uh, if there is any question from uh, the floor, I would like to entertain them now. I am from Saitama, and uh, Yamaguchi is my name. Uh, uh, I'm, because I'm not uh, uh, good to English, then I, I speak uh, not only in English, but also in Japanese, OK? Uh, <clears throat> so I would like to speak in, in Japanese, which is translated. Um, East Asian, when East Asian drink alcohol, alcohol beverages, some of them um, face color turn to red, yeah? Uh, this phenomenon is uh, called uh, flushing. Um, uh, it is uh, uh, especially in East Asian, but uh, um, according to some article, uh, this uh, phenomenon is, uh, was detected in uh, North, North America, uh, maybe uh, uh, Eskimo, a little. But uh, uh, Mexico American, in Mexico Americans, uh, um, nothing or very few. Then uh, in this morning, Mr. Uh, uh, Izho said, uh, we, when we th think about a uh, great journey, uh, I think I, we had to, we had better uh, by uh, not only on foot but also by boat. How, how about uh, uh, Izo is Sensei? Thank you very much. Of course, and, uh, direct evidence is lacking. We don't say there is any evidence. But uh, it is rather hard, more difficult for us and, uh, to say, no, there wasn't any uh, voting. And so in the uh, Japanese archipelago, so maybe food resources are used or not. That is an actually not an actually established. We need to have further discussion. Uh, but then, uh, maybe the stone tools are used. And also, maybe in some of the food uh, sources, they have to go uh, by boating. And so maybe if uh, there was a migration along the coastal line, naturally, so they were using the navigation technology. I think that is necessary to think in, in such a way. Thank you. Another one. In uh, North and South America, there was no earthenware discovered. In Ecuador, in the region of Guayas, and uh, Cardia, Cardia uh, site is uh, present, and uh, German-like uh, uh, stone uh, devices were actually discovered. Have you read that sort of report? So that uh, study was actually uh, done by the Russian University in the Far Eastern Research Institute. Actually, the survey is still in progress. Uh, I, uh, they found, I discovered a very, very early stage, an ancient, an uh, ancient answerware. Do you have any other question? Yes, please. Uh, it's actually Valdivia is from around like 6,000, 6,500 ish. Calvin that's the beginning. That's why it's like the early American sites have nothing to do with Valdivia. That's why, that's why the two are not really like talking to each other, I think. Before we go to the next question, I did actually want to respond yeah. to uh, Professor uh, Matsumoto's uh, question about pottery. Um, I think, I can't speak for my colleagues, but I think from my perspective in the North, it makes total sense for two reasons. One, 
the absence of, of pottery as movement, part of this movement. One, it would initiate around 16,000, at which time pottery was not widespread everywhere in, your, in, in Eurasia. Uh, it was actually quite localized, and, and most of it's after 12,000 you know, later. So it wouldn't be available. Uh, second, I, I really appreciate Ted Gable's work in 2002 in an evolutionary archaeology article where he's really pointing out some differences between the Siberian Middle Upper Paleolithic and the Late Upper Paleolithic. That Late Upper Paleolithic is really key towards high residential mobility. And the sites that, um, in his model, uh, are all relatively uh, short occupation sites. And the same thing happens when we start seeing them in, in, in Eastern Beringia. So in that context, pottery would not even make sense, even if there was plenty of pottery, um, um, you know, good raw material to be found. And third, when we do see it in the far north, it's definitely uh, diffusing from uh, the Siberian Neolithic. So peoples like the Belkachi uh, and the Umiaktak, you know, that material is easily seen to, to transfer, not with genetics, we think, necessarily, but with, with um, diffusion of ideas and about 5,000 years ago, or 3,500 years ago. Is there anybody with any question? Yes, and I would like to yes, and entertain some of the questions from the floor. A lot of stimulating talk, so thank you for all the speakers. And there are, I have actually many questions, but uh, maybe I, I choose one. And uh, I want to make sure that uh, uh, hearing your talk, the, in Siberia, there is a not homogeneous culture in the beginning, like uh, some of you said that Yana is uh, quite unique and Marital is also unique, and in Alaska also there are unique cultures distributed. But it kind of a great contrast what, uh, with what we see in Japanese island. For example, here, early upper Paleolithic rather homogeneous, and then we see a diversification regional diversification after 30,000 years ago. And then in Sherapa Paleolithic, you can, you, you can recognize uh, some wider distribution in the Olignacian, Gravitian as well. So what is the implication if this is, you, you don't see the homogeneous culture in Siberia? What is, do you, what is the implication from this pattern? So, John, do you have the recommend? Initially, all we have is, is, the, is this initial Upper Paleolithic industry that's in Siberia, Northern Mongolia, Northern China. It's spread all over the East Asia. Um, and then we see these regional industries begin to emerge after 40,000. Um, and it must be partly due to environmental variations as well as ice, you know, regional isolation. Um, but I think that's probably the normal pattern that we would see in any region after the initial population. It was just like Clovis and post-Clovis in North America. Um, as Once the initial settlement is complete, local groups begin to, to diverge and diversify and so forth. Mm. May I? Well, perhaps in the number of Sites, is that on? Sorry. Well, first of all, when you are surveying, the number of sites are different in Siberia in the United States compared with Japan. Well, you are substantially less. I think those are the tens, and there are the, the points. So there are very big difference between the planes and the dots. And more importantly, the size of river or geomorphology or behavioral patterns should be different. Therefore, as pointed out, in Japan, we do have the diversity. 
that is responding to the geographic environment in Japan. As Dr. Izo said, the length of distance from south to north and landscapes has the lots of the difference diversified. So therefore, it's very difficult across the board that the continental complex and the Japanese complex, some can be compared. But I think in the case of Japan, we have the minute analysis. So sometimes it shouldn't be the case to make a one-to-one -one comparison. Anybody else related to this? Anybody to make comments? Ben, or? We relate to that, um, but I did have a question uh, for Masami about his presentation. I found it very um, useful uh, in the way it was presented. A bit slowly, please. The way it was presented was very useful. Um, so I had a question about the way you displayed the Hokkaido record and the Honshu record. It seemed to me from the Honshu, you have the late Upper Paleolithic and then a very sharp divide and the incipient Jamon, whereas in the Hokkaido record, it looked like there was a period of 500 years at least, or maybe 1,000 years overlap. And I'm curious as to your thoughts on the nature of that transition uh, and why uh, incipient Jamon, you know, if it was coming from the south, moving north, what were the advantages? What, you know, because I, I calculated your numbers for the sites. It, it was an order of magnitude leap, uh, number of sites per 1,000 years from the late Upper Paleolithic to the incipient Jamon. And so why was there, if it was so advantageous, how can we explain that thousand year overlap where there's the two cultures uh, side by side? Mm. One idea is, well, let me divide into two aspects. LUP in Hokkaido, after 18,000 years ago, as I showed you in the data, there were plenty of people, but the trend was reduced. So LUP people trend was this, declining. But in this trend, as I mentioned, climate change, local climate change, substantially fluctuated, started. And in accordance with those pulses, when it's more comfortable in Hokkaido, then, then the Honshu people are migrated but sometimes leave away many times repeated. So that's what we have been observing, in my opinion. So this is very interesting and, and very different than our experience in America, where when you have a succeeding culture, like say the Clovis Folsom shift in, in the, um, the plains, it's immediate. And we really don't see you know, a long period of overlap. Um, and so that's interesting that that happened. It would be very interesting ecological you know, consequences of maybe the behaviors and maybe suggest they could be different peoples because they're holding on to a tradition based on historical connectedness and not so easy to shift to a new, uh, you know, new people with new ideas. So it, it might suggest maybe a, an earlier people that were not Jamon related. Mm -hmm. um, however, talking with Martin, there is that idea that maybe that was an an earlier Jamon population and then replaced by a, another Jamon population that we call incipient Jamon. We, we just can't say. Yeah, Jamon, Jamon is a very problematic terminology. <laughs> it will, but, uh, uh, can, can they say some? Uh, no. May I? Well, sorry, again, I want to emphasize this. Hokkaido small island from your point of view, but rather big island. And then Mr. taisho san example, taisho san that was the southern part of Hokkaido, that site. That is the only one which has that warm, temperate forest. When we got warm, the only that part can become warmer. So therefore, it's easier to think that the Honshu people can move into that specific area because of the temperature. Well, exactly have the same impression as you mentioned. I want to give you the present of Bush, the Hinata or Kitamachi for eight or 10 years. Those are the records of sites. And there, in these sites, since 14,000 ago in the cave. But the 
obsidians is very important. Well, your talk gave me the inspiration. I will speak more slowly. So, so the, it is very into, interesting. In Hinata, uh, Hinata, Hinata, Dog Hinata Cave site is one example. And actually, from Hokkaido, very strong push from northern downflow. However, if that is a, uh, the YD, then why the, the obsidian, local obsidian are more used, but there is a long distance. So the people migrated, but this is a sort of jump in Hokkaido. There is a new element in Hokkaido that's quite interesting. Maybe not well communicated. Martin? May I? May I? Well, Ben's question is interesting, so let me respond to me. I would like to give you our question. This is not the assumption that everybody agrees. For example, Dr. Michael Water, uh, existence of period of the club is very short. Within this short period, contiguous U.S. Well, the sites expanded. Whole United States cannot be explained by clubs. Therefore, pre clubs should be there. Otherwise, phenomena cannot be explained. I think that's what he said or wrote. In that sense, like the Hokkaido, the fluctuation, that kind of phenomena cannot be observed in the United States. However, I think that, that could be one example that we see for clubs, pre clubs. Is, is that a question to counter question to Ben? Yes. That's, that's a, a good question. I think the difference um, that I would point out is that from the genetic side, we do have the information, and it's all a single population. So it's not, uh, so we're, we're now, we're talking about the difference between the, the material culture people make versus the biological population they're part of. And so I think if there's one thing that I think is a very strong, compelling new idea from the genetics over the last uh, you know, decade has been the emergence of a very clear single pulse, a single founding group south of the ice, the Southern Native American SNA group. And it's rapid and it's explosive. So the discussions and the debates that are had about the material culture is operating at a different scale. You know, it's a, a different um, question. And I don't think it's resolved. I know that we all probably have different ideas on what it could mean. Um, some of it's related to which sites people accept. Um, there are no perfect sites, um, and different people have different uh, perspectives on each of them. So I think, uh, I wouldn't say it's the same where you have traditions that overlap for thousands of years um, in the same, you know, Hokkaido is a big island, but the Great Plains is a, is a a major physiographic area, and the replacements we see are immediate, um, quick. Uh, so it's not to say it didn't happen. I think that's very interesting to me that you know that could be very productive to explore the differences as uh, incipient Jamon people adapted to further north, you know, conditions, uh, and contrast with the people that were there already. Um, I think that's a very it could be very fruitful to examine that. Uh, Martin, yes. Martin at first. And then uh, next is Lauren. Can you hear me? Does it work? Yeah. Yeah, just to follow up on that, I think th this, this was all very interesting. In that you know, it, It's funny for me to hear Japanese people say Japan is a small place because I'm from a very small country called Austria, right? For me, it's all very big here as well. So clearly, Hokkaido <laughs> is also a very, very big place. And, and it was very interesting to hear that you have these different ecological reasons why you might have some part of it in the southern slopes where uh, other, other um, subsistence modes would be more uh, suited for, for the, the, the incoming uh, people. So I just wanted to comment that we do have an, a very nice and interesting example of that with the, from the genetics also from, from Western Eurasia, from the Caucasus region. So there was a paper by Wang et al. in, in, in 2017, I think, where you know, they had a 3,000-year time transect of people from the from the steppe north of the Caucasus in the Bronze Age and on the slopes of the Caucasus, 
where you have uh, in, in both places uh, 3,000 years of ancient DNA transect, and these people remained very genetically quite distinct over this 3,000 uh, year time period. It's just different ecosystems, different adaptations of the people to those local ecosystems, maintaining quite distinct populations over, over uh, you know, quite quite a long time period. So I, I do think this is entirely, you know, plausible and possible this, for this also to happen in a, in a place like Hokkaido. Mm. So I wanted to, in case people um, in Japan are not entirely clear, when you see a map, Sometimes when researchers are showing the distribution of Clovis, you'll see a map that commonly has you know, more than a thousand dots on the map and it's all over the United States. So the impression that's given with that is that somehow that represents one type of cultural pattern and that then you'll hear Clovis dates to a very narrow period of time. So you're given the impression that it ha this distribution of Clovis points happens immediately. It's just everywhere. And so this is often why it's described as a migration into the Americas. So the problem with that data set is that those data points, almost all of them except for about, what, 12 sites or so, are not, 11, are not dated. Mm. So 99% plus we don't know the age of them, and there's a lot of variation that happens. So there's a lot of variation in the form of how fluted points are made. So there's not one type. And so there's a lot of debates about does the phenomenon of fluting actually persist for a long time? And then also the transition from something like Clovis to Folsom doesn't happen everywhere. In fact, Folsom is not a pattern that appears everywhere. So it's not really clear how this all happens. So I think that we have to be very careful when we're told that it's a really neat and clean pattern because the reality is that it's actually quite unknown exactly how much of this happens. So, so just, just to you know, be careful as a consumer of knowledge. Yeah. Not Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Daniel? I wanted to return to the Sorry, I don't need to hear myself in two, in two <laughs> places. I wanted to return to the, the question of pottery and its disappearance. And I, I'm just reminded that pottery appears at many times and, and disappears as people move. Um, with the Belkachi culture, roughly 5,000 years old, um, I think is probably ancestral to Arctic small tool tradition. Belkachi has pottery. Arctic small tool does not. Um, Eskimo cultures in Alaska and in the Russian Far East, Siberia, I'm sorry, Russian Far East, have pottery. When they move into Canada, they do not. Um, so maybe, maybe part of what we're looking at is a difference in mobility. Pottery is hard to transport. Mm. Um, well, you can carry the pieces, but um, you can't carry the whole pots so easily. So maybe they're there's something of a mobility signal there. Yeah, and that, that's, that's it also. I wanted to say, uh, today I shown this as a site, uh, one archeological site in the northern Siberia, the Borisho Yakuri. There are very long chronological sequence, archeological se sequence, and they're included the typical uh, UBIT type uh, microbread core, but without pottery, even the back to the uh, 11,000 years ago. But from Barshaw Yakuri to the same river basin, the Bichim, uh, the very famous site is Ust Karenga site. It's dated 12,000 BP. There are a large number of the pottery. And also uh, pottery, all this pottery with Ari, uh, 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 with the uh, microbread complex. So in, uh, actually in the Ust Karenga uh, site, not involving a typical uh, typical UBIT technique, but wedge-shaped core. So in the same regions, one side existed the pottery, but other side without pottery. It's maybe, I agree, totally agree to the maybe mobility pattern or seasonality, se seasonal differences is uh, pottery, one side up, appear and uh, this uh, side it disappear. So it is a very northern area and also very deeply related with the mobile pattern and so on. Mm, not everywhere. 
そうごめんなさいもう一人石田さんはい One more person Well,、uh, for a big game hunter comment by Dr. Kato, I have a question. Yesterday, as an introduction, Dr. Benport mentioned that.、Uh, well, uh, can I? I think I, he had、uh, said this, four things, and that involved the、uh, ecology of a hunter gatherer, I remember. And、uh, Sensei mentioned that, that North Eurasia, inclusive of、uh, North America, hunter gatherers who are in those vast areas、uh, were mentioned, not in detail. But、uh, I have a question to Dr. Cutter. It was、uh, 2019.、Uh, there was、uh, Dublin's big academic conference in this area I joined. And Homo sapiens came from Africa, originated from Africa, and adapted to the、uh, tough environment. And、uh, there was a session on that particular topic. But,、uh, well, they did not take up the cases we are debating yesterday and today. And I think we need to deepen. The Kato san's assertion, not a big game, but a medium and a small game hunter, for example. The, I think、uh, there is not much need for a scheme o for a, a reindeer mobility, which would not、uh, transfer very long haul. And also, use of the、uh, rivering, you mentioned. Yes.、Uh, What、uh, Dr. Kato mentioned is a hunter gatherer's habit who does not need a big mobile mobility in a kind of a limited area movement only. And in a way, there is a situation that、uh, the, some areas are not very suitable for those kinds of uh, the uh, adaptation by、uh, new people. So, What is,、uh, in terms of a society, in terms of a territory, I think、uh, the mobility is very restricted and small in your assertion when we pursue your line of、uh, logic. I don't think a mobility is just a confined or a small area. Rather, when we, I think when we explore the diverse resource. Especially in a、uh, northern area, the resource is、uh, scattered in many areas. I think the、uh, mobility should be just the opposite, the long and vast amount. Otherwise, we can't get access to the、uh, dispersed resource. And also,、uh, I think,、uh, for example,、uh, the Sungio. Uh, for example, the child's buried、uh, tomb. With a lot of、uh, decoration with a、uh, child and also Malta as well. When we look at the grave tomb situation, there is、uh, a very common、uh, phenomena, not very specific to one area. What I wanted to say is that、uh, we should not be confined to the big hunter image too much. Rather, we need to be. Looking into more diverse、uh, resource a r e a like a river lane near the lake and shore, the fish, the birds,、uh, in a way,、uh, the berries and also wood, the fruits, use of the plant. I talked with Ben yesterday about that. So, that, not just focusing on the big,、uh, you know, mammoth hunter. Just, that's what I wanted to say. Dr. Inamura, please. My name is Inamura. Thank you. So, South America, Andean, and、uh, the farmland people, actually, that the nomad people are actually my specialty. My in is an anthropology in culture. And so, we are looking at the、uh, roots, and also, we are looking at the、uh, Belenian migration as a s o u t h when and looking at the roots. I was very fascinated with the presentation focusing on the most up to date research. 
Among the presentation today, you talked about dogs, but dogs are not now so much mentioned in the presentations. But dogs are very important factor, one of them, very important, I think. So with regard to dogs, for example, genetically speaking, the peoples and the population's migration can be traced, I think. Focus by focusing on dogs. And also the utilization of dogs were in what way? And how did people actually capitalize on the dogs? In the lives and people's lives in Beringia, how were they using that? And what sort of impact and was given by dogs? And of course, on the other internal route and also the coastal route, they were mentioned. So both on the coastal and also the inland. So are they related to the existence and the presence of dogs? So I, uh, I was an actually very inspired. Many questions are coming up in my mind. If we try to answer all of them, uh, we need to have another symposium. We need to have much more time. But if you have any idea about it, I would be very, very interested in that question. May I? So you, so talking about an Andean, let me say that I'm not an archaeologist, however. So Peruvian, Peru, and the earthenware was uh, discovered about 1800 BC. That was an uh, original earthenware in, and discovered in Peru. And uh, in Ecuador, it is actually 2,000 uh, 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 areas. So maybe actually the morphology is very clo close to the Jomo morphology. The, uh, the oldest in Ecuador is an actually the goo, actually that an earthenware human uh, picture, human uh, model. So through the coastal migration, people were actually moving. And so maybe if we talk, think about it more, the coastal movement, how should we look at an Ecuador, elsewhere, and also the German? So sometime ago, they never thought about it, the linkage between Japan, German, and also the Ecuador. But I think that it is now emerging. There is some potential, I think. The link might have been there. And so actually, it is called the goo, actually, was where uh, modeling of human body. So, but uh, it, um, it is, it will be enormously difficult uh, to verify that and validate that. That was uh, my comment. But I was actually very fascinated with your talk. So, um, for, uh, yeah, I had a, just a quick comment. Um, so, yeah, the genetics on uh, North American dogs, uh, the research is. Uh, exciting. It's mm -hmm. another proxy for uh, people. And um, the work so far seems to replicate what we understand from the uh, human genetics, so a, a rapid dispersal around 15,000 years ago or so. Um, I can tell you that we are uh, on board with looking for dogs actively in archaeological deposits. Um, they are very rare. Um, we have a few examples in Alaska that we're specifically working on now to, to try to nail them down. Morphologically, if you just have fragmented remains, sometimes it's difficult to tell and you need genetics to, to firmly confirm. Um, but yes, that's on our radar. And I suspect uh, new discoveries are going to be forthcoming. M Martin, do you have any comment? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a specialist in dogs, but yeah, I concur with, with, <laughs> with Dr. Potter. There is there is a lot of interesting work going on in, in ancient dogs also, also in, in Copenhagen, where I'm from. So so I think there's going to be a lot of exciting insights quite soon on, on, on that as well. Um, I think I just wanted to quickly comment on this question about the link between Ecuador and Jomon. Um, I mean, uh, again, so far we haven't really discovered any links genetically between any present day or ancient Native American peoples and, and Jomon. And so, you know, doesn't mean that we will not never find them, obviously, but there's a chance we might find some uh, uh, links in some skeletons at some point in the future, but so far there's no, no evidence for that. Mm -hmm. What about the dog, actually, that an awesome were modeling human body in the ancient times? Yes, uh, thank you very much. And uh, Dogu is mentioned, actually, that the Asunwea human body sculpture, so, and actually Asunwea, so including America and also Eurasia in various localities, and uh, they uh, come out, image, and uh, they disappear when the time comes for disappearance. So maybe Dogu, that the Asunwea of the human body modeling is almost the same. 
And so more than that earthenware, they were actually produced in a large number. So human figure, anthropo anthropomorphic big figure. So it is a uh, clay figure. In some of the cultures, they produced many. I think it is related to the level of the uh, settlement. In the early settlement societies, they were produced in a large quantity and number. And so if in a highly moving and period, maybe that sort of material might be lacking because high mobility was actually actually in that kind of age we are talking about. But when they reached that environment and for the settlement, maybe the situation was de might be different, even though they were not directly carried by them. So maybe they invent that sort of human figure with an earthenware. So that is a new process emerging. And so it is not mutual diffusion, however, same Similar things might appear as a new one. So that process is very, very fascinating and interesting too. May I? So I would like to make kind of some additional comment. So actually, the general tendency is the same. So actually, 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 the so about 20,000 years ago, actually, uh, with regard to a settlement or non-settlement, that the human figure was actually produced, not an earthenware. So the conversion uh, was uh, happening. So it's not surprising that we discover that human figure in many places. Uh, Dr. Hofekupaka, you know that, and uh, along the NSA, uh, minor and uh, minor uh, site, uh, and there was an actually the human figure discovered. Do you have any comment about it? So El say, any say. So in the case of actually, actually clay was fired to create that and human figure. As I know, um, it's that rather amorphous looking clay figure. Um, yeah. One of the few from that time period. Um, yeah, I don't know, I don't know what to it. <laughs> okay. It, uh, so we have got another 10 minutes or so. So maybe on the part of the Japanese and the speakers, do you have any particular comment or question addressed to the, the, uh, the presenters from outside of the Japan? May I ask one question if you don't mind? Sea level, um, more than 15,000 years ago, um, maybe the sea level was lower than current level. Maybe uh, Hokkaido was larger than current size, yeah? Then, uh, <coughs> uh, unknown, uh, unknown islands uh, might be there. How about uh, Mr. Izzo? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Madam 15 years ago, the coastal line was what? So, yes, you are right, right. About uh, it was actually lower, um, lower maybe one, by 100 meters. It was actually significantly lower than the current level. Hokkaido and also Tsugaru Strait and also offshore Tsugaru, there is an interesting material. Actually, actually, that uh, bifacial standpoint was actually captured by a fishing boat. It was not coming from the river. So we look at uh, now those and uh, the surface, it was actually coming from uh, somewhere not so distant, maybe close enough, maybe uh, closer enough uh, to the shoreline. In those days, humans were actually working and uh, uh, taking some actions. So that uh, is very interesting. So that could be the evidence uh, of humans and activities on the shoreline. Since this is a good opportunity, Related to all the theme, I would like to ask a question for anybody, if you are kind enough to give me the person. For example, UBIT's method for uh, established technology has been discussed for the migration as the technology. But the stemmed point that I stated, this is a comparison of the shape. So what I want to ask is that the similarity, how to grasp the meaning of similarity. For example, Davis, coincidence, that means they're just uh, mimicking 
the others coincidentally? Or is that the similarity with the intention to copy or just the coincidence? And what is the judgment point? In the minds of Davis, for example, evolutionary convergence, this is the convergence, this is the just happen to be similar, or, well, I, I think you referred to those. But so how do you make that judgment? This and this, very similar, but is that related or just that is the mere coincidence? How can we make judgment of those? For example, Davis or Potter or anybody, do you have those judgment criteria? Lauren, who should be? Who? Oh. Well, thank you. I'll start at least. I'm sure everybody has a, uh, an opinion about the question of when you see two different artifact shapes, how do you decide if they're related or not related? Um, <clears throat> I, I think about this often, and I, I sort of wonder about what are the best ways to test this idea. And so one measure might be considering the um, two, two factors. One, sort of the geographic distance mm -hmm. and proximity. Like, does it seem reasonable that people may have moved from one point to another? And then how much time is separating these different people? So an example. Uh, at the Cooper's Ferry site where I work, later in time, we see the presence of a technology that in my region has been named Lavawa-like. Now, it doesn't mean that it's Neanderthal. It just means that they're sort of using the similar ideas to take long, flat flakes out of a spherical piece. So they set the core up the same way. So then you can ask the question, is this descendant from or derived from Lavawa techniques? Lavawa is another way. They derived from these techniques that we know are present earlier in Transbaikal and places like this. And I wrote a paper saying I didn't think that they were really related because there's so much, for me, dis difference in time. So if I saw younger and younger and younger ones getting closer and closer to North America, Maybe I would think there could be the chance that these ideas came with people, but I think there's just too much difference in time. Now, in the case of stemmed points, we are just faced with the problem of there is a number of archaeological sites that are south of the ice before the ice-free corridor is open, and they happen to be stemmed point technology. So. If we don't see anything before the presence of those stemmed points, we have to ask where else is the, the place where this idea is beginning. So I just simply look to, as I talked in my presentation, where do we know in Northeast Asia people are making this similar technology? Now the question about whether they're exactly the same or not, I don't know. We haven't done enough work yet to figure that out, so that has to happen. But this is the process. I mean, we could say it's not, you know, PSHK, it's, but where else? I mean, where else will we look? I mean, there's no other place I know of that's making these kinds of things that close. I mean, we could go farther away geographically, maybe, and try to find an example, but that sort of makes the argument more complicated. So, um, so that's sort of the logic so far. I don't know that we'll be able to get it exactly precisely the same, because if you're talking about people leaving an area and migrating to the Americas, if that took many, many generations, you have the problem of as the knowledge is being taught to the next generation, the next generation, we get drift. You're going to get changes in the technology. It's not a perfect transmission, especially if it takes a while. You know, multiple generations. So I would expect there's going to be some changes. So that's why I was emphasizing that it's not so much the little small variations in the shape, because there's an internal three-dimensional shape that bifacial core, now I don't mean in reduction, but I mean like the central part of that projectile point is not present forever. It shows up only at a certain time in Northeast Asia. So, you know, before, let's say, the beginning of uh, bifacial stemmed, you know, projectile points in J Japanese archipelago or in South Korea, 
you know, it, you have to kind of ask, well, where else will you find these? So I'm just fixated more on the, the central idea. And I'm not trying, I don't want to get too distracted by minor variations where someone goes, well, the, the ratio of the width to the length is not exactly the same, so it can't be the same people. I think that's too simple. We have to think more about the, the larger ideas that people are bringing. Anyway, sorry, that's a very long answer. But. So I think that's a, a really excellent question. And as Lauren uh, mentioned, it's made more difficult because there may be historical connections or it could be independent innovation. Uh, it could be variations on a theme, it could be convergent evolution, and they all will lead to the same result, equifinality, right? That's always a problem. And there's a vast literature on isochrestic style and trying to identify those elements that might be functional and then those that might be free to vary. Um, so I, I agree with Lauren, it's a very difficult task. Um, the way I think about it, um, again, I like the multiple lines of converging evidence that help us solidify our hypotheses. I like the, uh, the uh, direct historical approach, right? That's where you can have existing peoples, you can understand their technology, you understand their genetics, you know their language, and then you go backwards, okay? Then you look, what are those elements that stay constant? When do you see variation that's extreme, that, that looks like a major change of life way? Um, and in 2010, I, I did a, uh, an element of that looking at Northeast Asia and, and Northwest North America. And to give you a, a small example, you know, Athabascan or Dene people uh, uh, tradition, we understand their ecological relationship to the subarctic. It's very distinct where the boundaries are and we understand the material culture. We can push it back to the Northern Archaic, which is the preceding culture. About a thousand <laughs> years ago, there was a major change, but yet we do have uh, human remains that date into this period and their Dene also. So that makes us feel very firm that the Northern Archaic probably represent this group. There's longstanding relationship and borders between say Eskimo Aleut or Yupik and Yupiat peoples along the coast and these interior folks and that that boundary is stable, so I think maybe encouraging us to look at stable boundaries through time that have ecological significance. Um, but when it goes to 6,000 years ago, I have to stop because I don't know. There are changes at 6,000 years ago where the borders change. So people are actually, that were in the area, were using other areas. Um, they could be the same, they could be ancient Beringians, they could be a different group. And from what I looked at, like old Koryak, uh, you know, going back to Tokareva or Tarin in, in Kamchatka, it seems like 6,000 years was about as far as I was comfortable in, in suggesting lineages. And it wasn't based on any one artifact. There'd be multiple artifacts that stay constant. Um, so like uh, a number of us mentioned, the Sialak, Belkachi, Umiaktak, there's a series of, of materials like the, the polyhedral burins that probably wouldn't be independently innovated, but they occur throughout that record. And some archeologists have argued that's continuity of, of population. And there's variations uh, on that, but largely the, the conical cores, you know, the multiple items that show those, those traditions are very helpful for us. Um, but if it's like individual pieces, it makes it much harder. And I don't have an answer, you know, for which of the possible choices, given the vast distances that we're dealing with, um, the convergent evolution that, you know, stemming has appeared many times uh, on the planet in different contexts, and stem uh, has historical context, you know, where people continue those traditions. Um, so it's challenging for us to do it, but I encourage, uh, you know, all hypotheses should be on the table, and, you know, I, I think we can hopefully make progress with more data, and I think we all agree more data is what we need. Hi, domo Yes, thank you very much. I think one minute over the closing time that we scheduled. For two days, we conducted a symposium. This is the last program round table discussion. And I think time runs out. And later, Ben is going to give us the closing remark. But Potter, a strat from the two wisdom people, we have this program, Eurasia, that is attracting a lot, especially genetics progress, and a bold model has been presented. Then, archaeologically, how can we respond to? So that was a trial for this symposium for discussion. This was a challenging program that we started but for the last two days, 
we made a discovery of new opinions. People's migration can be obtained from the RIFIC or precise uh, data is required, maybe. So personally speaking, we ended up with the great fruitful results because of the two initiator. So Potter and Stuart, I'm truly grateful for your initiative. And lastly, so that's all for my part. But now Potter is going to give us the closing remark. Okay. Um, so I've made a few notes. Um, I have a few things to say in closing. Um, I think we have uh, met and exceeded the, the hopes that we had in bringing together uh, Western scholars and Japanese scholars to, uh, to deal with these issues. Um, I think bringing that diverse expertise has allowed all of us to appreciate the multidisciplinary nature of the problem that we encounter and that the solutions will likely also need to be multidisciplinary uh, from the genetic side, the paleoecology side, the archeology span side to bring models that are rigorous, um, that can be tested, uh, and that we have directions for, for how to test. I'm also um, appreciative of the synthetic discussions that we've had. I think all of us has, um, have tried to bring in our own perspectives um, synthetic approaches, so beyond an individual site or beyond an individual data set, and be appreciative um, from design theory uh, to geoarchaeology uh, to the genetics uh, to the paleoecology, all of that's critically important, I think, to make reasonable, plausible models um, for this very complex uh, topic. Um, I think we've identified that we don't have easy answers, but I think you know we now understand how difficult those answers might be, given the, the uh, wide variety of data we do have. And I think it encourages us to collaborate more, to have more collaboration with our uh, colleagues in, in lithic analysis uh, across the Pacific Rim, uh, as well as with geneticists, and be in the same room. So it's not just the archaeologists talking to each other, um, but, but more collaboration. Um, I, I like that we've identified specific data sets that we need, like specific data we can go after, that we can emphasize. I'm very encouraged to hear about the sediment DNA work. I think that is probably going to be a game changer, both potentially in Japan, but also in the Americas. Um, we didn't talk about it much, but we have huge gaps in our knowledge of um, ancient samples, ancient peoples, particularly in Eastern North America and large stretches of South America. And I'm hoping that as uh, we uh, maybe get better proxies, maybe sediment DNA, we can fill those gaps. And I think it'll be a, a much fuller picture um, when we have those. Um, I think we should remain open to multiple competing hypotheses, and I'm very happy that we've had a very collegial uh, experience, um, even though there may be differences of opinions and they may be strong. Uh, our field has unfortunately sometimes seen a lot of uh, antagonism, potentially, with, with people with uh, very different ideas, um, but I think this is a model for how we can uh, progress forward together. Um, in terms of data, I don't think we yet see a fully emerging pattern, but we are seeing emerging pattern fragments from different regions, and I think that's encouraging. Um, that I'm very, uh, particularly the, the STEM point discussion has been very uh, uh, informative to me. Uh, our literature, uh, the English literature, is not as uh, uh, detailed as some of the some of the uh, work that we're getting here. Uh, and I think we need to articulate with that strongly, more strongly. Um, and I echo Mike's uh, comments and, and also uh, Kenji's comments about really solidifying the geochronology, because everything is going to be built on rigorously dated sites. In the absence of those, we're free to vary more widely with our ideas. Um, so I, I, I think that's an important element. Um, so we are, we are bringing these many pattern fragments to the table. New models, I agree with uh, Professor Kato, new models are needed um, that can accommodate and that can explain and more importantly predict new data uh, that we might encounter. Um, and we can stick our neck out that maybe our ideas are wrong, but at least we've put forward ideas that can be tested. Um, and without this kind of symposium, and hopefully more like it, it would be much more difficult to, I think, fully articulate uh, the varying parts of these, these issues, uh, both in uh, the Russian Far East and Japan, Circum-Pacific, and into uh, Beringia and the Americas. 
much more difficult to even articulate the problem, much less find solutions. Um, and I look forward to future collaborations, and I hope this can be a model for you know, uh, you know maybe larger uh, conferences that we can bring more voices to the table uh, with different expertise. Um, I think you know paleoecologists would be a, a very important uh, component for the next iteration of this. Um, uh, geneticists, obviously, uh, and, and a variety of archaeologists that are working on these problems. So I thank each and every one of you for attending and, and making this a successful symposium. Thank you. Thank you very much. So do you want to... Yes, please. It was a very exciting content uh, of a presentation, and I appreciate uh, all of you. As Dr. Potter mentioned, yes, in order to have a solution of a problem, uh, we were able to summarize it and put it on the table, at least. Uh, that is uh, important. So from overseas, uh, well, there are uh, several uh, first-related people uh, would your Lisa Davis and Waters and Poisson. Thank you very much. You, each of you are the first uh, reputed uh, uh, doctor, and also the uh, Dr. Potter. I'm sorry, you uh, skip your name. You are important. And uh, what should I say? Yes, anyway. Thanks to the uh, distinguished experts in each field. Uh, that is only possible with uh, the leadership of Dr. Potter. And also from our Japan side, Dr. Kato, Dr. Ota, thank you very much for your effort. Yes, I don't know the young scholars, young archaeologists myself, so yeah, Kato-san has uh, yes, uh, uh, searched for the young extinct, distinguished scholars, and also the Matsumoto-san. Thank you very much. I appreciate your effort. Your practical effort is very much appreciated. Thank you. OK, the very last. And also the people who supported uh, the behind the scene, Dr. Onishi, uh, Onishi-san, thank you very much. You are running about all the time to support this symposium. Well, uh, the leader and the planner of the uh, other symposium, Dr. Matsumoto, will close the session. Thank you very much. Yeah, it is uh, the last of the last remarks. And uh, I'm sorry. Thanks to the cooperation of all of the experts, we were able to uh, have this uh, exciting and inspirational uh, discussion and symposium. So myself, as uh, Dr. Stewart mentioned, and as Dr. Potter summarized, we summarize and pick out uh, or highlight uh, the issues, identify the issues. We are not able to solve the issues, but uh, we at least uh, can identify what is lacking or what is still res un remain unresolved. I think this could be a good start point for future research. Myself, the, this project of Out of Eurasia using the 3D model, that is, I think, is very important. So as Dr. Davis presented the, your research that using that 3D model of a stone tool is, I really expecting your work. And also Dr. Nagai, uh, that uh, flaking technology you are researching on, uh, distance of both of you are very far apart, but I think we are able to discuss from the same perspective. I think uh, evaluation and assessment of the stone tool will be uh, uh, very much different, and we will have uh, new discoveries by applying your 3D technology. And the uh, symposium this time, uh, we only have this face-to-face -face meeting, so the participants, speakers are in one place. 
And uh, because of this physical setting of face to face, we were able to have this kind of a hot debate, exciting debate. And I guess this issue is interested by many people in the world. So there are many who are not able to make it here because of a physical reason. I would like to share the result of this uh, uh, symposium towards those uh, uh, big audience. And uh, we decided that we would like to open the result to all of the world by YouTube, YouTube. And we need to you know, go beyond the barrier of language, thereby we use these simultaneous interpreters. So we have an English version of this symposium and a Japanese version as well. Well, I think uh, really uh, shortly after this, we are able to disclose the, uh, the video. And when we make it, make it, I will give you the link to the video. So why don't you advertise to your colleague scholars so that they are able to see the YouTube. Thank you very much for your cooperation and a nice uh, bon voyage to you.